hard to get people in a room in August. Um, just a couple of stuff like this. So um, I'm gonna moderate, so I'm gonna actually be relatively quiet. So for people who know me, that's kind of shocking to hear. Um, but first, I'm gonna introduce our speakers. Uh, Radley Horton is the Associate Research Scientist at the Center for Climate Science Research at Columbia University. Um, he's gonna speak about the latest science around uh, climate change. And then Dana Koshnauer, the Senior Policy Advisor at the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Recovery, I'm sorry, Recovery and Resiliency, um, is gonna talk about what the city's doing in conjunction with this research. So with that, and we're gonna, the idea is to have a fairly um, engaged conversation, so uh, think about questions you have been dying to ask about climate change, but to never had anyone like Bradley to ask. So um, with that, I'll give Great. it to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, great to have the opportunity to be here today to talk to all of you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right, good. Um, I'm going to try in less than a half hour or so to sort of take you through some of the most recent developments in climate science. Um, I'll talk a little bit, provide a little context going into the um, Paris negotiations um, this December. Uh, talk a little bit in that context about cities in general um, and where they sit uh, as sort of a key leverage point in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, and also preparing for some of the climate uh, hazards that we already face and that even under the best case scenarios, if we are able to reduce our emissions dramatically, we are gonna see some of those hazards increase. So we'll talk about uh, ways to, that cities can lead on risk reduction too. Then I'll transition to um, talking specifically about um, our work in New York City on the climate side. We're gonna operate on the assumption that a lot of people in the room are somewhat familiar with, with the climate projections already. So I'll just sort of focus on a couple of key points and try to leave a little bit of time um, sort of point to some new directions of wh where we may be going um, in the climate research for New York City as NPCC3 mm -hmm. um, gets going. Um, so good, let's uh, jump right in. I gotta remember, I don't need to point this at you, Dana, I can point it back there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good, so I, I, I love the title of this session because I mean, really when we think about the hazards that New York City faces, um, we think about heat waves, a major one um, that yeah, I think globally and in the U.S. has really been underestimated. Um, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, the extent to which heat waves kill and how, how some of that has been, been underreported um, in the past. As sea levels rise, coastal flooding is gonna become a much more serious problem, even if storms don't get any stronger at all, just by virtue of that basic sea level rise. Um, so we need to prepare for more frequent coastal flooding simply because sea level is gonna continue to rise. We'll also talk a little bit about heavy rain events, um, which when we look at historical trends, absolutely do appear to be coming throughout the entire Northeast and, and, and further afield becoming more frequent. So climate change will manifest in a lot of ways as we think about specific hazards in the city, we can think about more frequent and more extreme heat waves, more frequent coastal flooding, and also more severe, and also more heavy rain events. That's sort of the basic place to start, but one of the points I'm gonna try to emphasize is that um, as we all know, New York is you know, a global city, part of a much broader community. When we think about vulnerability, when we think about the need to reduce our emissions, we gotta get beyond thinking about just specific climate projections for our city, because there's a whole broader context of, uh, of issues that we need to, need to be thinking about as well on the, on the climate side and on the hazard side. And New York City's leading in that thinking, fortunately. Okay, um, so some basics. 2014 was the warmest year on record um, globally, according to many of the data sets that we use. This is a plot just showing if you average all the temperatures for the year 2014 in each of those places, how do those temperatures in 2014 compare to a historical 30 year average? Anywhere you see orange reddish colors, that means 2014 was warmer than the average. Uh, the blues, including over a big part of the US showing areas that were cooler than the average. So looking at one year of data, even in a global average, actually doesn't tell you that much. Um, still, it's, it is relevant to mention that 2015, it looks like is almost certainly gonna break that record. We have a strong El Nino event developing. Uh, at this point, we're pretty much locked into 2015 being the warmest year of record. Um, to get a broader sense of uh, you know, what this means, an individual year can be climate variability, sort of random noise. But if we see long-term trends in the system, that's much harder to explain away as just random variability. We 
have to start looking at the impact of greenhouse gases, which we know for basic physical uh, understanding should be warming the, the, the planet. And it is, as carbon dioxide concentrations have gone up about 40% since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So as I just said, let's now look at the longer term trends. This figure, instead of focusing on 2014, is showing you the trend over 112 years for each of these grid boxes um, uh, over the world, trends in, global, uh, trends in temperature. Anywhere you see um, a red or a purple color, those are areas that have strong warming trends going back to 1900. The purple is going to be something on the airport or close to a four degree Fahrenheit trend. Now you see a fair number of places that are white. That's actually places where there's no data. Not places where the trend is close to zero, places where we don't have enough good historical data for especially the first half of the 20th century to even say what the trend might be. Where you see the blue colors, just a few isolated spots in the North Atlantic uh, Ocean and over a small bit of the Southeast US, those are places that have had a slight cooling trend. Those are the only places that have had a slight cooling trend. And that cooling trend is about a tenth the size of the, of the warming trends that I mentioned. So half a degree um, over about 100 years or so. So when you look at the big picture, we've seen dramatic warming, only about one <coughs> degree Celsius of warming uh, so far. Already, though, um, we're seeing big changes in the frequency of extreme events, much more frequent heat waves, melting of land-based ice sheets, um, a variety of changes in the system that go beyond global average temperature. I, we don't have time to talk about all of them now, but maybe in the discussion we'll be able to get into some of those other ways that the system um, is changing. But quickly, to stay on temperature for just, for just one moment, one of the take-home messages from this talk is that small shifts in average conditions can have profound impacts on the frequency of the kind of extreme events that we all care about um, in our planet, that humans are vulnerable to, that our electrical systems are vulnerable to. It's those extremes that really matter. You shift the average conditions a little bit, you could profoundly change the frequency and magnitude of these extremes that we're vulnerable to. That's what this figure shows. This is showing, when we look across a large number, 1,800 different weather stations across the United States, comparing how often each of those weather stations is giving you a record-breaking high temperature versus a record-breaking low temperature. So it's organized by decade here. As we look through um, sort of the 50s through the 80s or so, there was variability by decade. Um, but for the most part, the ratio is roughly one to one, as you'd expect if there was no climate change. You're about as likely to get a record-breaking hot day as you are to get a record-breaking cold day. As we move into the 1990s and the 2000s, though, you see that ratio shifting dramatically. By the time you got to the, to the decade of the 2000s, you were getting twice as many record-breaking high temperatures set across that big number of stations as you were record-breaking low temperatures. So your global average temperatures, your U.S. temperatures, have only gone up by about a degree or so, a little more for the U.S., a degree, a degree and a half. You're at a point already where you're getting twice as many record-breaking hot days as record-breaking cold days. Small shifts in averages mean big shifts in the frequency of extremes. When we look at other variables like sea level rise, we see the same thing. If you think about a slow, creeping increase in sea level, globally only about eight inches over the last century. It doesn't sound like much. It's already becoming a game changer in many places in terms of leading to much more frequent coastal flooding. Okay, so key points um, for this talk. Um, you know, one thing that I, I wanted to take the opportunity here to talk a little bit um, about scientific uncertainty and precision. You know, one thing we try to do when we make local projections is always advance the science, bring in all the, the latest information, and we do push the science forward each time. But you know, from a decision-making perspective, from a planning perspective, I want to highlight that um, we shouldn't look for the climate science in the next few years to suddenly sort of provide the exact answers that will lead to shifts in planning. I would argue that we sort of already know enough about how the climate is changing, and you know, honing our precision on you know, is precipitation going to go up by 11 percent, 8 percent? We're not going to be able to really sort of narrow that uncertainty in the next few years. And I would argue from a planning perspective, this is a discussion we can all have, that you know, it may not even be that important. We shouldn't sort of lean on the climate science. I think it's too much of a crutch. Um, obviously, it's just one of many factors and many uncertainties um, as we plan and, and, and consider greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, a corollary to that is that even if we end up on the lower end of the projections, if we get lucky and only have one foot of sea level rise instead of six, 
that one foot alone, as I indicated earlier, is going to mean much more frequent coastal flooding. So under the best case scenario, if you accept the premise that we're vulnerable today, we're just going to, from a climate hazard perspective, we're just going to get more vulnerable. Um, it's still important, obviously, that to, to, you know, the planning requirements are totally different for one foot or six feet of sea level rise. But I think it is important to emphasize that that um, uncertainty shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be an excuse for, for, for inaction as other forces uh, nationally and, and globally have at times um, argued. Okay, and of course we don't appear to be on track uh, for the lower end of the projections. Um, in some ways, I think the story is becoming a little more optimistic in terms of the international pledges that are coming together around Paris. Things are looking more optimistic than they were before. But still, you know, based on the pledges that we've seen to date and the pledges that currently seem to be likely by December, probably are not enough to, to get us quite within that two degrees Celsius target. Um, although, if it's a stepping stone towards more pledges thereafter, you know, maybe we can still make that two Celsius target. Um, but part of the issue in trying to say, can we stay within two degrees Celsius, um, is the challenge of uncertainty in the climate system. Do we really know how sensitive the climate system is to greenhouse gases? And I want to talk a little bit about the potential for surprises, feedbacks in the climate system um, that you know, could indicate that we don't have quite as much, as much wiggle room as we think. Is a, is a little bit of warming going to introduce changes that in themselves cause more, more warming? Those are uncertainties, but from a risk management perspective, it's a really compelling case uh, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, to decrease the probability of those um, dangerous and to some extent unpredictable outcomes. Fortunately, cities like New York um, absolutely at the vanguard with the 80% plan that I think we'll hear a little more about. Um, uh, that's the kind of leadership that's going to minimize the possibility, the probability of these unpleasant surprises. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what the impacts of two degrees Celsius warming might be. And if we do limit ourselves to two Celsius, of warming globally, what might happen. Okay, so a little bit of science here um, when we talk about that sort of penultimate point on the slide, how sensitive is the climate system to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations? We've known since middle of the 19th century that greenhouse gases should cause warming. Um, the uncertainties are around how the climate system will respond to that increase in greenhouse gases. As the system warms, Will the planet change in ways that cause more warming or tend to cause temperatures to sort of bounce back, bounce back to where they were? This is the notion of, of feedbacks and surprises. So here, a negative feedback is something that tends to push the system back where it started. So a negative feedback would be an example where greenhouse gases cause an initial warming. A negative feedback would be a situation where the planet somehow responded in a way that pushed temperatures back towards where they started. So an example might be if we see the, the initial warming causing a change in a type of cloud that actually is good at blocking sunlight. That would tend to push temperatures back down. Unfortunately, as we look at the climate system, we're seeing much more evidence of positive feedbacks. Positive um, not being a normative term here, but implying that if you warm a little bit, the system changes in a way that gives you even more warming. There are a lot of examples of this. I'll talk a little bit about the, the case of Arctic sea ice as a classic example. Um, as you melt a little bit of ice in the Arctic due to a little bit of initial warming, you lose that white surface that had been so effective at reflecting sunlight. Now you have open water where there used to be ice. Open water is extremely effective at absorbing sunlight. Gives you more warming, which melts more ice in a positive feedback cycle. We're seeing more evidence of those types of feedbacks, and that's part of why um, we're concerned and we really need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions dramatically to decrease the risk of some of those positive feedbacks. So a little bit more. Okay, so and then in terms of what, what might happen under a two degree Celsius target, even if we make that target, um, we've already seen so much loss of Arctic sea ice, way beyond what climate models suggested, for example. Um, it raises the possibility that um, the models may underestimate some of the changes from a climate perspective. There's also the impacts per se side of things. We may have underestimated the extent to which some of globally some of the most important crops are sensitive to high temperatures. If you pooled a lot of the IPCC and the scientific community, the crop modelers, 10 years or so ago, you would have tended to hear a lot of parts of the world, some parts of the world may really benefit um, from more greenhouse gases. Be a longer growing season, the carbon may actually help crops grow a lot better. 
Those arguments can't be thrown away entirely, but over the last five years or so, there's been more and more awareness of how, especially in a lot of developing countries, a lot of crops are already sort of near their threshold of what they can handle in terms of high temperatures. And even just one to two degrees of warming looks like it can lead to big, rapid drops uh, in crop yields. So two degrees Celsius, even if we make that target, um, it's really important that we understand that that doesn't, doesn't imply we're sort of out of the woods in terms of, in terms of major risks. I don't have time to go into all these, obviously, but we can you know, have a little discussion. Uh, offline about some of the other topics of, their, of interest to folks. All right, a quick sort of rundown on what's happening with uh, Arctic sea ice. So these are sort of up to date. I think these are the maps from a couple days ago. What you're seeing on the left here is the, the white is showing you the extent of Arctic sea ice um, on August 10th of this year. And if you can make out that, um, call that magenta uh, line there, that's the average for sort of all August 10ths over the last 30 years or so. So this year, big stretches of open water of the type that can be absorbing sunlight, right? We still have essentially 24 hours of daylight right now up in the Arctic. These areas are all absorbing more sunlight than they would have in the past when that would have been uh, a white surface. And we're also seeing that in some cases, there are some areas that are technically within the ice pack, seriously degraded ice, um, uh, cases where the ice seems to be sort of a slush. Um, so that causes a lot of concern. That's happening much faster than climate models suggested it would. So this obviously is a you know, spatial map. Here you see a uh, plot basically just showing the um, aerial extent. Now, so what you can see here is May through September. September is the time of year when we expect that, ar expect that Arctic sea ice to go to its minimum. Um, the average for the 30 year period uh, is shown in that gray color. Here's a sort of two standard deviation band. About 95% of the time you'd be in that bound. Here's 2012, which has been the worst year to date on record. And that blue is sort of where we're tracking um, right now. So the point I'm trying to get at here is that there's a real potential for surprises. As that ice starts to go, we don't know um, what might happen over the next month or so. Um, in the next several years, we can't, out, can't rule out the possibility that that ice will deteriorate to such an extent that it'll basically be a runaway process and start to go. The best science suggests that probably won't happen for another 10, 15 years. But I believe that, in principle, it could happen any, any summer. Um, and I think that will argue, that will basically introduce sort of an unprecedented um, situation. Because we don't know how the system will respond if there's open water when you go into winter. Um, OK, so going to the next slide. Now, again, just to emphasize, I'm not saying it's going to happen this year. The odds are it probably won't happen in the next five years. But it's a possibility. Um, if we look at this from a little different perspective, this is a little hard to follow. This is showing you the volume of Arctic sea ice. So instead of just the area, multiply that area by the thickness of the ice now. This is sort of a true measure of how much ice there actually is in the Arctic. All right, so we got to spend a little bit of time talking about what this graph is actually showing, of course. Um, okay, so you have the years up here. That's 1979. That's 2013. Um, each of these colors represents um, a month. That's the zero value, and that's a value of 30 units. So, that, so as you get further out from the origin, that's when the ice was really, really thick. Uh, OK, so let's start. Let's, let's go ahead and just look at September, which is the month when that Arctic sea ice tends to be the thinnest, when you tend to get the minimum. If you go back to 1979, your units were about 17. As we sort of move forward through time, each click represents going to a new year. You can just see that over time, we've gradually moved closer and closer to that zero point. That's 2012. Had a value. We'd lost about 75% of the volume, the quantity of Arctic sea ice in September. Now, it's important to mention that the two years since 2012, not shown here, have shown a little bit of a bounce back in that volume. So this isn't just every year dropping. But 75%, you know, even if that's down to, you know, it's improved a bit, it's a 60% volume loss since the late 1970s. That's way beyond what any climate model suggested might happen. Points to the potential for, for surprises. Now, we've been at the cutting edge of a lot of um, research, speculative research, I would say, at this point, exploring whether this loss of sea ice in the Arctic might indirectly actually be affecting our weather in the mid-latitudes. It's not clear yet what the answer is. Um, certainly, we've had a lot of cold and extreme winters in recent years. Some of it might be natural variability. 
I don't think we have time to get into a real discussion of it now. Maybe in the, in the comments we can go back to it. But the basic argument is that if you reduce Arctic sea ice in fall, you reduce the temperature gradient between the tropics and the poles, the thing that drives the jet stream. Uh, if you warm the high latitudes a lot, your jet stream gets weaker. And then a weaker jet stream, the argument goes, is more able to get this type of pattern, the light orange, where you have these sort of big amplitude waves, big cold fronts dropping <coughs> south, at the same time that really warm air can be making its way further north. So really extreme weather that's long lasting. The old pattern would have been this one of a sort of, uh, not a perfectly flat jet stream, but not as big a troughs, not as many intrusions of warm air to the north or cold air to the south. Speculative research, but example, you know, of the kind of thing we need to be thinking about and the potential for surprises. Okay, I have a feeling I'm behind on time. How much more time do I have? Uh, ten, minutes. ten minutes. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to try to speed things up a little bit. So before we get to New York City, uh, hopefully I've sort of made the case now um, that from a risk management perspective, if you're trying to avoid um, potentially really dangerous outcomes, there's a really strong argument for dramatically re re reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Clearly, there are a lot of compelling arguments for reducing um, emissions. Now, cities, of course, um, including New with New York's leadership, are at the forefront um, of some of these efforts to reduce emissions. Here's some of the examples. Cities are responsible by some measures of 70% of greenhouse gas um, emissions. 60% um, of the world's population is expected to live in cities by um, 2030. A lot of people moving towards cities um, around the world. So cities can be a key actor here, and they are. Um, of course, cities are also uh, affected, very vulnerable to climate change. Um, city temperatures tend to be a little higher in cities because of the urban heat island. Um, they're also very vulnerable to heavy downpours, right? We have all these impervious surfaces where water can run off dramatically. And of course, a lot of these coastal populations, these urban populations, live right along the water. Uh, so that's sort of the physical vulnerability. Then there's all the social vulnerability uh, issues, too, that, that, are, that are faced um, uh, in many cities. There are different dimensions to that social vulnerability as well. So fortunately, cities really are um, uh, at the vanguard, I would say, on the mitigation side, adaptation, and resiliency side uh, as well. Cities have emerged as first responders. Here are some of the ways over the last uh, decade or so that, that cities have taken the lead um, organizationally. Um, if we ask why some of the reasons are that cities um, have tended to lead uh, relative to maybe nation states, there's this sort of direct interaction with constituent, day-to-day um, -day management, operational day-to-day -day sort of responsibility um, uh, uh, toward, toward city members. Um, and they're able to form flexible networks, I would say, sort of across cities maybe, uh, arguably a little more nimbly than, than, than nation states may be able to. Um, but clearly for cities, there are many challenges, challenges of dur jurisdiction, which you know, certainly exist in New York, for example. Financing, um, not all cities, you know, it's a challenge in New York. Of course, a lot of cities don't have anywhere near the resources um, you know, when they think about adaptation. Uh, uptake, uh, you know, how do we help small cities? Those are some of the, some of the interesting issues. Leveraging across cities, leveraging across network systems, infrastructure that's shared across cities, power grids, um, train systems, that sort of thing. Um, knowledge partnerships, sort of going into Paris, it's all about these partnerships within cities, across community groups, basically just creative, nimble ways to, uh, to sort of acknowledge that it's not just nations um, that can be key actors um, in terms of uh, mitigation and adaptation. Okay, so within uh, our group at Columbia University, uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig, who uh, chairs the NPCC along with Bill Selecki, um, who's at Columbia, also chairs this Urban Climate Change Research Network. Um, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, this basically produces an IPCC type report for cities, focused on city issues. Um, okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, I think we can share these slides. Um, okay, so I'm going to start to transition to talking sort of specifically about, uh, about New York City. Um, but as we're thinking about resilience, as we think about uh, leadership of cities like New York, resilience is obviously includes many dimensions. There's this, um, built environment component. Uh, there's the policy issues that have to support um, engineering design and standards, for example. There's the social element. I think the current administration in New York is really thinking a lot um, about how to protect vulnerable communities, how to organize systems, um, that, that, that social networks that make sure people aren't isolated, having early, early warning systems in place. Um, but really, it take, takes a range of sort of all these approaches. 
uh, hard engineering so solutions, more ecosystem-based adaptation, um, you know, all, you know all, all these types of things are, are being considered. All right, I'm gonna go on the assumption that everyone sort of already knows about the New York City panel on climate change. I hope that's a safe assumption. If not, we can, you know, talk about that. Uh, and I think, I, I think Dane will go into a lot more uh, detail on this probably. Um, okay, so there's a long history, um, even just within our group, of sort of doing climate assessments in New York City and New York State. It really goes back to about 1996 or so. Um, but clearly over the last five, seven years or so, New York City has really upped the efforts um, and you know, continues to be absolutely at the vanguard um, in all this work. If we go to our um, uh, latest report, which we'll hear more about in a little bit, now we're talking specifically about New York City. We've gone from the global projections, the global historical trends, to New York City specifically. New York City's had more warming than the global average, about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit since 1900. There has been an upward trend in precipitation. Um, not that strong, though, when we think about that upward trend. It, it's real, it's tangible, but when you compare it to the variability year to year, we still very much, you know, any given year can, can get a year that's, you know, well below the long-term average. Uh, whereas if we look at sea level, you can really see that we've already sort of entered a new regime relative to periods earlier in the century. There is some year-to-year -year variability in sea level in New York, but even a year with low sea level um, today already has totally different statistical properties than the years of the 1950s. If you're planning for climate change, you still plan for a little bit of year-to-year -year variability, but your statistics have, have completely changed for sea level rise um, in a way that if you sort of built your planning on what you experienced 30, 50 years ago, uh, you'd be poorly tuned for the climate of today. For precipitation, it's a little trickier, but as we, as we get out into the future, we expect these climate changes, sea level rise, temperature rise, to accelerate. The basic argument is there's still gonna be year-to-year -year variability, there's gonna be year-to-year -year uncertainty, but the statistics are gradually shifting, the dice are getting loaded towards higher temperatures, uh, more coastal flooding, and fortunately the city's planning for that. Okay, as we talk a little bit now about the projections from our report, again, we, you know, we look at how average temperature is gonna change, average precipitation, average sea level. Those things are really important, but at the end of the day, what probably really matters the most is what that implies for the heat waves. Uh, and we suggest that those could triple in frequency by the time we get out to the 2080s or so. Not just becoming more frequent, but these are longer lasting events. We don't get the cooling off at night that's so critical for human populations. And those absolute highest temperatures during heat waves are higher than they used to be because of the nonlinear relationship between energy demand during a heat wave and temperature, the nonlinear relationship between the probability of, of, of people suffering health outcomes as temperatures go up. That extra couple degrees matters a lot. The energy system doesn't care that much if, if the temperature on a given day goes from 61 degrees or six, to 63 degrees. That's not that important, but if it goes from 101 on the hottest day to 103 or 104, that could be the difference between the power grid being able to handle it or not. Um, sea level rise. There is big uncertainty about just how much sea level rise we're going to get. We don't know how much of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets are going to disgorge their ice into the ocean and make sea level rise. We know it's going to happen to some extent. We don't know exactly how much. But under a range of scenarios, if we consider what's sort of a worst case scenario for the 2050s, but a sort of middle of the road scenario for the 2080s, something like three feet or so of sea level rise. That in itself, even if storms don't change at all, we're not saying hurricanes are stronger, we're not saying nor'easters are smaller, just raising sea level by three feet will turn the flood event that currently happens about once every 100 years into something you can expect during the lifetime of the typical mortgage, a roughly one in 20 year event. So, if we, so that's sort of looking at it from this probability perspective, frequency of occurrence. The other way we can think about this coastal flooding is in terms of the actual area that gets flooded once a year as sea levels rise. Again, we're not saying storms are getting any stronger, just raising that sea level is going to move that, the area that suffers that one in a hundred year flood inland as depicted in this map. Um, all these numbers have uncertainty again to emphasize, but from a risk management perspective, these changes are so big that while there's uncertainty, they still, um, obviously have key implications for our planning. So what this is showing here, um, the blue area is showing you sort of present day climate, what area gets flooded once every 100 years. And then these colors are depicting with the sea level rise, what's the new area that's getting flooded um, uh, once every 100 years as we get out to 2100. The red showing those areas that by 2100 could be in uh, the one in 100 year flood 
lights on. Under an extreme sea level rise scenario, I should say. This is sort of a close to worst case scenario of sea level rise, we think. But what's the worst case scenario for 2100? Maybe a sort of middle of the road scenario for 2150 or so. And again, this doesn't imply storms getting any stronger. Okay, public health impacts. How am I, am I, I must be out of time by now, huh? Two minutes? Okay, good, that's about right. <laughs> okay, so you know this is this is something that not just in New York but but in the U.S. and globally is getting much more 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 attention now. Public health uh, impacts of, of climate change. Uh, when we think about the city, I mentioned heat waves already is a critical issue. Obviously, as we learned after Sandy, there's a, a, a myriad of ways um, that coastal storms and flooding impact human health. Not just the direct effect of the storm, but psychological impacts thereafter. Um, damage uh, to buildings, mold hazards, all those sorts of things. Um, there's all sorts of other public health hazards to think about, changes in pollen rates, what might that mean for air quality, foodborne illnesses in the future, all different um, sorts of things to, to think about. At the end of the day, um, there's going to be variation within the city um, in, in, in high temperatures in the future. That's important, but there's also this sort of social vulnerability piece that obviously varies a lot by neighborhood. Um, and I think the current administration is really tuned into those to those issues. All right, um, maybe in the interest of time, I think, so I have a few slides that sort of highlight some of the key findings um, or sort of what the, city's, what the city's doing. Dane will be much um, uh, more able to speak to those issues um, than I will. So I think um, I'll move through some of these slides, one on mitigation, one on sort of building related issues specifically. And then just quickly sort of close by saying some of the ways that, that we're sort of looking towards going in the NPCC3 uh, now reconvening. On the climate science side, which is you know where my focus is, we want to focus not just on the extreme heat issues, but also really bringing in humidity. As we all know, it's not temperature alone; it's the interaction with that high humidity events um, as well. So we're really going to look at that risk because um, because it has such an impact on energy demand, risk of power failures, and human health. Um, more generally, we're going to focus on extreme events. So when we talk about coastal flooding next time around. It's not just going to be what will sea level rise do, but also pushing the science a little more. We still don't know exactly how hurricanes are going to change. Are, they, are the strongest hurricanes going to become stronger? Are the strongest nor'easters going to become stronger? The science isn't there right now to let us do sort of full quantitative projections, but we think the science is there to let us sort of qualitatively um, say a little more and sort of based on a few assumptions, say a little more than we have in the past. So we'll, we'll, work, we'll look to sort of push the science on extreme events um, uh, as well. And then some of the other things, the NPCC will be working on uh, uh, shown here. Okay, um, so just circling back to my key points uh, from early in the talk. Um, beware false precision in all these projections. Um, at the end of the day, we don't know if the worst case scenario is X.6 degrees or X.9 degrees of warming. Um, we're not gonna know that in the next decade or two either. Um, the question is from a risk management perspective, has the climate already shifted? The statistics of the climate already shifted enough and is going to shift enough more in the future to argue for changes um, on the adaptation side. And given the uncertainties, are those actually an argument for more aggressive greenhouse gas mitigation of the type that we're seeing uh, New York City uh, leading on? And again, even if we get lucky and get the low amount of sea level rise, we're still going to see, as we saw, a dramatic increase in the frequency of coastal flooding uh, and heat events. And even with some optimistic signs um, going into Paris of sort of national pledges, uh, we're still not yet on target to hit the two degrees Celsius target. Even if we hit that target, there is a risk that the climate system will give us some surprises. Right now, we're sort of comfortable in the idea that we are the arbiters, we are the drivers of how much greenhouse gas is in the atmosphere. It's largely true right now, but the more we push that system, the bigger the chance that we'll get surprised by things like melting of more permafrost, that give off natural, if you will, carbon dioxide and methane. But the oceans might change in a way as they warm that makes them less effective at absorbing carbon. Um, those are some of the risks. And even if we do make the two degrees Celsius target, have we underestimated uh, the ability of human systems, cropping systems, to deal with even, even those sort of quote unquote smaller amounts uh, of warming? Thanks. So, Dana, you're, he has some good news, right? Yeah. <laughs> it there seems like it's the good news now. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, but it's just what, uh, well, go ahead, I'll give you one. Okay, um, do I just keep going forward and then, okay. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. Oh. Uh, go, there you go. Okay. Okay. So thank you for having me here today and um, speaking on behalf of, of the city. Um, we were, just to put it a little bit in context, if you're not that familiar with the NPCC, so um, the NPCC is an independent panel of scientists and researchers coming up with the projections and kind of giving the landscape to the city. And then it's up to the city to decide how we use that information. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, and coming off of all of that, I'm gonna start with Hurricane Sandy, which really brought the issue of climate change right to our doors and um, brought new urgency to the conversation around climate change in New York and regionally. Sandy, as we all remember, was a, a deadly storm. There were 44 lives lost, um, and it was a very damaging and expensive storm. There was $19 million in damages and lost economic activity, and Sandy left thousands of New Yorkers displaced from their homes. But when we think about what we're going to plan for for the city, we're not just planning for the next Sandy. We're also planning for other 21st century threats, including a growing population. They're expected to be 9 million New Yorkers by 2040, um, increasing inequality, which Rob has mentioned a couple of times. And New York City, as we all know, is a pretty old city, and our infrastructure dates back over a century in some areas. And I'm not gonna go through all these projections again, I just wanted to highlight that we are also planning for climate change. So we have these 21st century threats and climate change kind of compounds all of that. Um, in April of this year, uh, Mayor de Blasio released one NYC. Looking ahead, uh, New York City is about to begin our fifth century in the next 10 years and this plan envisions how we want the city to look and how we want the city to operate in 10 years and beyond that. And One NYC is organized across uh, four main visions. Our growing, thriving city incorporates our policies, our challenges, and our actions that we're gonna take to deal with things like population growth, real estate, uh, transportation challenges, uh, workforce challenges, our just and equitable city talks about what Bradley had mentioned, uh, social issues and ensuring equal access. Um, our sustainable city talks about, um, comes up with a plan really for how we're going to address our contribution to climate change. So the, that in, includes the 80 by 50 greenhouse gas emissions reduction plan uh, and moving towards zero waste for the city. And then our resilient city is what I'm going to focus on. So resiliency is a word that's getting thrown around more and more um, in the climate change conversation. And it's really important for us to define how New York City looks at resiliency. And the way we see it is that our neighborhoods, economy, and public services will be ready to withstand and emerge stronger. I'm just going to underscore withstand and emerge stronger. So we don't only with, we don't only get through these extreme events, but we actually build smarter for the next time from the impacts of climate change and other 21st century threats. And the city has committed to a multi-layered strategy for resiliency. And that includes neighborhoods, which is community level um, strengthening, uh, both at the social and economic level, um, buildings, upgrading our building stock, like our infrastructure, a lot of our buildings were built uh, over a century ago, upgrading that against climate change impacts, infrastructure systems, adapting both in the city and then regionally, and of course our coastal defenses. New York City has 520 miles of coastline, and as Radley mentioned, we are already seeing the effects of sea level rise, and we expect that to go up in the future. And although I started with Hurricane Sandy, the city didn't start doing all of this work with Hurricane Sandy. This uh, one NYC and our work in these areas dates back um, to the previous administration, 
2007 was the first plan YC, which really laid out the city sustainability plan. And then I just want to mention that in 2012, the city did uh, pass a law that made its commitment to the New York City Council on Climate Change part of the continuing um, part of the law in the city. So we have the New York City Council on Climate Change, and then we also have a Climate Change Adaptation Task Force, which works with all of the infrastructure operators. And they use the projections from the New York City Council on Climate Change. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about infrastructure. And so I'm gonna go through those four areas, starting with our neighborhoods. And as I mentioned, um, community-based organizations are a key to the entire city's resiliency. We've learned from Hurricane Sandy, and we've also learned from other disasters that communities that, are, that have stronger ties, ultimately the people wind up doing better, they're more resilient in those events. And so the neighborhoods area focuses on building and strengthening those ties both within communities and then between the city and communities. We are launching a Hurricane Sandy Recovery Task Force, which is actually community-based and faith-based organizations trying to work with them and figure out how the city can more closely work with them to get through future and prepare for future extreme events. Um, we're also working on areas of emergency preparedness and planning. We're working with um, small business owners and organizations trying to build economic resiliency. And then, as Rafi mentioned a few times, heat is a really big issue. And at the community level, it's a big issue. And so the city has convened, along with academic partners and nonprofit partners, and the Department of Health, an urban heat island mitigation working group. And what you're looking at here is a heat vulnerability index that um, the city Department of Health created, um, adapting from a study conducted looking at mortality rates from heat events. So this group and breaking it down by heat vulnerable neighborhoods. The Urban Heat Island Mitigation Working Group is looking um, to have pilot programs in specific neighborhoods to both figure out how to best monitor air temperature and collect data at the neighborhood level, and then also how to quantify the programs that we have, such as Million Trees and Cool Roofs, where we paint roofs white to try and reflect the sun and cool the buildings, um, try to quantify how those are actually mitigating the urban heat island effect. Moving on to buildings, as I said, a lot of our buildings are old, and we also have different kinds of buildings in New York than, say, other areas that are flood prone. Um, and so we are working to adapt our buildings to come up with retrofitting strategies. Uh, the city has updated the building codes to elevate buildings that are located in the floodplain. Um, and then we're also working with FEMA on the National Flood Insurance Affordable uh, Program. I can talk forever about the National Flood Insurance Program. <laughs> <laughs> questions about that, um, and we are working with FEMA and advocating on behalf of New Yorkers. Um, and then our Department of City Planning, in conjunction with the Office of Recovery and Resiliency and other city agencies, have launched a Resilient Neighborhood Study. And this looks at 10 specific neighborhoods, and it's trying to, it's taking a comprehensive view. So looking at not only um, what are the challenges, say, from flooding, but what are the challenges um, economically? Uh, what are the challenges in, say, the building and the zoning code that are keeping people from being able to raise their buildings in these areas? Um, and so this study is currently ongoing and really examining how our land use planning um, can also help to build resiliency in the city. 
And then moving on to infrastructure, um, as I mentioned, so a lot of our infrastructure is aging, and it's also connected beyond our five boroughs. So the city is working with regional partners to repair and mitigate and adapt our infrastructure. Uh, the city is, there's a lot of investment going on in the city. There's been billions invested in upgrading and retrofitting our hospitals, um, 3.2 billion to uh, NYCHA houses to make them more resilient. And then the city is also working, as I mentioned earlier, on the, we just reconvened the Climate Change Adaptation Task Force. And this is a group of 60 city, state, federal, and private entities that control or operate or maintain infrastructure. We have representatives from Con Ed, we have representatives from MTA, we also have representatives from the freight industry and the liquid fuels industry, telecommunications partners are in there. And the idea of the task force is we all work together to coordinate our adaptation strategies. The NPCC comes and talks about the climate science and then we can all start working together toward making the region more resilient. And in addition to our traditional infrastructure, the city is also doing a lot, as Bradley mentioned, with natural infrastructure. I mentioned planting trees. You're looking at a picture of what's called a bioswell, which is the green areas in the street um, that help to absorb the stormwater in large rain events. In Staten Island, for instance, there's been some acquisition <coughs> to try and expand the blue belt and build out Best Madison Middle High School. And then, of course, coming to our coastal defense. So as I said, 520 miles of coastline, and as we saw in Sandy, we are vulnerable to flooding. Um, and with sea level rise, we're looking at increased vulnerability. In June of 2013, the city came up with its first comprehensive coastal protection plan, uh, $3.7 billion for the first phase. This is um, including a mix of traditional and engineered coastal defenses such as seawalls, um, and then also some natural, using natural strategies. So um, doing living shorelines around Jamaica Bay, say for instance, there's been 3.5 million cubic yards of sand put back on the beaches um, and dunes in Staten Island and the Rockaways. And then what you're looking at here is a rendering of the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, um, which is from the Rebuild by Design competition, which is a comprehensive protection strategy for Lower Manhattan. Um, this idea, for instance, would be a living berm, so a park that would also be flood protection for the city. And with that, Great, thank, thank you. you. Oops. Uh, so I have a couple questions we're gonna start with. Okay. And then um, are we doing like cards or just, should I just call people? Should I just call? Just call, okay. So um, yeah, think of your questions, please. So Bradley, first, um, thanks for talking about the Arctic, so that, that sort of, uh, jet stream impact, it's something I've been trying to follow. Another is um, the Atlantic thermocline mm -hmm. and how it may get disrupted and that changes how the, the, Atlantic, the temperature of the, the ocean affects our climate. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that? It's probably a big topic. Sure. I'm just curious. Sure, so, um, <clears throat> so I highlighted one of, in talking about the Arctic sea ice, I highlighted one of the ways that uh, climate system could potentially surprise us in the sense that climate models do predict loss of Arctic sea ice, but not as fast as what we've actually observed over the last few decades. So that just gets us thinking more generally about where there might be other surprises in the, in the system. Now, um, 
one element of the climate system is the Atlantic thermal haline circulation. So what this basically is, is a, a pattern where, um, all right, so let's say that this is basically the North Atlantic, this is the tropical Atlantic surface, and then the ocean at depth. So the normal situation in the North Atlantic is that near the surface you have a Gulf Stream um, of surface water that's warm because it's coming from the tropics, making its way to the North Atlantic at the surface. Um, one of the reasons that that water, not the only reason, but one reason that moves north to the North Atlantic is because in the North Atlantic right now, there is a tendency for water to sink. And the reason that water sinks right now um, is because that's an area where you have salty water, which tends to be heavy water. Salty or heavier, so it sinks. The concern is if we continue to see Arctic sea ice melting quickly, if we also see more rainfall in the high latitudes, which is another projection um, that we're seeing some evidence of, there's some risk that what's currently salty water near the surface could essentially become capped by less dense fresh water. You basically flush a lot of melting Arctic sea ice, which is low salinity. Um, if you have other sources of Greenland um, ice melt as well, that could give you a kind of fresh water cap, which would make it in the North Atlantic more difficult for water to sink. If there's less sinking going on there, there's less of a need to have a replacing current at the surface that's bringing that warm water from the tropics. So you basically could sort of break down to some extent this circulation pattern. Um, now, a couple things to mention. Climate models feature that to some extent. So there's, you know, it's possible the climate models can, can, can tell us what will happen there. Um, there is some evidence that that circulation may already have weakened a little bit. Um, on the other hand, we haven't had that many years of measuring. Uh, you need a lot of you know, sensors in the ocean at various levels to say what's natural variability and what isn't. But there is some evidence that that circulation is weakening and that, according to the models, it could weaken more. If it does, it has implications for everything from temperatures in Europe, um, which could potentially actually get colder um, if you don't have that warm Gulf Stream green as much. So it's just another one of example of, of one of these surprises. Um, what might it mean for New York? So, yeah, good, <laughs> good, good point. Curious. Yeah. Um, so it could potentially change atmospheric patterns, things like something called the North Atlantic Oscillation that influence how often we get cold air outbreaks. But the most obvious impact that it could have would probably be in relative sea level rise um, along the East Coast. So basically, this seems to, you know, we tend to think of the ocean on average as being a flat surface, but it's actually not. The, the sort of typical average sea level on the northeast coast in New York is as much as a foot or so lower than the sea level on the other side of the Gulf Stream. So if you sort of picture that Gulf Stream current again at the surface going from the tropics to the North Atlantic, if you're on this side of the Gulf Stream, sea level tends to be lower on the New York side tends to be higher on the other side. That implies that if you weakened that surface Gulf Stream, you would tend to bring sea level closer to equilibrium, which would mean relative sea level rise for New York, in addition to whatever's happening, because you're bringing more you know, melting water from Greenland, Antarctica, in addition to the global average sea level rise, we could. But this is, again, you know, this is um, not a sure thing. Um, and, and the amount of additional sea level rise that that would mean for New York almost certainly would be a smaller term than, than this issue of Greenland and West Antarctica melting. But, but it's, it's an example of another, another type of factor that we just need to watch, I'd say, from a risk perspective. Um, uh, yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to ask any questions. I'm going to jump, jump, jump in here. I, just, I, I, I have to, then I'm going to stop talking. You know, I, I've highlighted, I think, some of the risks, but it really is important to emphasize also I mean, what are we seeing from New York? And it's not just New York anymore, right? But we are, we are seeing technological innovations. We're seeing the price of a lot of renewables come down. We're seeing more and more of the kind of uh, sort of honest discussion about risk um, and, and considering the full range of outcomes. Um, as you see a little more of that, a little more sort of cooperation, it's opening up, I think, possibilities of more rapid greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Private sector is getting more involved. So, that's got to be part of the positive story, even as we're focusing on some of these negatives. Speaking of risk, Dana, mm -hmm. like, how does, I mean, it sounds like we need to be doing everything right now, but we can't. Like, there's not enough funding, there's not enough human beings to do what it sounds like we need to do, to hear what Bradley's saying. How does the city 
manage risk and think about what to do first, how they prioritize all of the challenges, um, help people understand. I, I mean, I'm just curious. Like, right. you're, you're on the forefront of fighting this invisible war. So I think um, I think number one, having information is. Um, the highest priority, mm -hmm. so working with the NPCC and, and having updated projections and knowing what is coming mm -hmm. and what to plan for. And then, um, and then part of that is um, what we're using, which is adaptive pathways, which mm -hmm. is not just building once and saying, okay, we're good, but building and monitoring and in this constant conversation with the NPCC, with the scientists, what do we, how do we need to kind of alter that along that path? Mm -hmm. um, I think that Sandy, um, you know, to kind of, not to keep going back to that, but Sandy, Sandy, while it was devastating, it also brought with it a lot of federal funding <laughs> that is helping to pay for this program mm -hmm. um, of coastal defenses. Um, and then at the same time, you can't just look at one risk. So right. it's not just about flooding. We realize also that hurt, that heat is yeah. an issue. And so trying to really take a multi-layered and multi-risk approach. Um, and I think that's kind of how we're gonna keep moving forward in all of this. In the front row, your question. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to NPR this week, and I was surprised to hear a climate scientist speculate that the cluster of leap years would be the cluster of leap years would be that which would occur in response uh, could be attributed to climate change. And he said specifically that the heat, uh, the intense heat, and also the intense wind spreading uh, the uh, pathogen could uh, start a cooling power. So, is there, what work has been done? So the question is specifically about Legionnaires. I'm just using the outbreak. On this one, I have to take a pass and say I don't, I don't know about the climate uh, science links. It's an interesting question. I'd like to follow up on that. Um, more generally, um, you know, there is a lot of work that's going on about various types of, of pathogens in New York and globally. I mean, obviously, these are, you know, there's in many cases a variety of hosts and vectors. It's hard to track and it's hard to generalize. but. For many different types of species, I think it's fair to say that there's concern that as temperatures go up um, uh, for certain types of uh, pests that can be killed off by cold temperatures, um, that may be less likely to happen in winter or the sort of light season of these things will become longer if you have a shorter freeze season. And then additionally, if during the heart of the warm season, if temperatures are higher, gives you the potential for sort of faster reproductive cycles for, like I'm here, thinking about here about things like malaria that we don't necessarily, dengue fever, some mosquito-borne illnesses. It's hard to generalize though because <coughs> you also think about what's happening to precipitation, interactions between different species. But in general, there's concern about a lot of types of arthrop arthropod, insect-borne diseases, mm -hmm. um, potentially increasing due to higher temperatures. Um, um, and so, I, I, yeah. That could also impact our our forests, our woodlands as well, so not just the <coughs> but the, the natural systems we need to yeah. provide our reservoirs, fresh water, and so forth. That's a great point. I mean, there's, you know, New York, New York City doesn't just think about the city boundaries, right? Our reservoirs um, extend 120 miles north mm -hmm. of the city. Our infrastructure sheds, our food sheds extend beyond the city. The southern pine beetle would be one example um, of a species that could be critically important. Um, it's been making its way towards New England. You know, you can't necessarily say it's all climate change, but there has been research suggesting that that critical, really cold temperatures, especially in, in, in parts of the West with pine beetles, you need those really, really cold temperatures in winter to sort of knock these species down. If you don't get those really cold temperatures, they can tend to spread. Now, having said that, we've had some really cold winters in the Northeast in the last couple of years. So it points to some of the complexity. <coughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, Chris, as you said, you know, if you have a chance uh, or if you have a question about climate, uh, climate science, uh, never had a chance to ask, now's your chance. Yeah. So that's what I do. Um, general question on, in recent years, there were a lot of articles about Ar Arctic sea ice mm -hmm. and how it goes down in the summer and these are some very yeah. disturbing stories. A lot of 
normal time. And uh, the response, in my mind, absurdly, from the political side and from industry was to say, hallelujah, now we can get to all the gas and the oil that we previously oh. couldn't get to because of the reason of the summer time. And so, uh, obviously, if you do the math and the two degrees and the 400 parts per million and all of that, if we extract all of that oil that now we can get to, you know, well, then it's game over. Then we're probably going to be close. So my question is, A, what I have never been able to figure out reading just the newspaper, how much does the amount over of time over which we extract that oil matter? If we, if we burn it all in the fall in the next 50 years, mm. it would be 100 years, 200 years, how much does that matter in terms of the climate system and all the feedback loops? Right. And what would be your advice to policymakers about how much of the oil we need to leave in the ground permanently? Yes, there's a lot of really interesting aspects to that. Um, so one, one of the, I think, sort of key contributions of the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report is that for the first time, they talked about cumulative carbon emissions. So they sort of got out of the context of saying, what are we doing per year, and basically said, if there's sort of a reservoir, carbon lasts in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Um, the heat that gets into the ocean stays there for a long time. Um, so they basically shifted the perspective to saying, what percentage of what we can sort of afford to burn in any time scale have we actually burnt? And the research suggests that if we want to have a good chance of staying under two degrees Celsius of warming, and again, we've already had about one degree of that two degrees Celsius of warming, we've probably burned half or more um, of what we can get away with burning. Um, and again, there's, these are probabilities. You know, from a risk perspective, you might think we could get away with a little more or a little less. Those are partly risk discussions. There's uncertainty. But you know, the IPCC and a lot of mainstream you know, science have concluded that we've already burned half or more of what we can afford to burn. And of course, you know, last year notwithstanding, we're still accelerating the amount of emissions um, in general, globally. So if we stay on those trajectories, something on the order of 25 years or so is probably about when we might hit that cap of what we can sort of get away with burning. Now, there have already been a lot of studies getting towards this notion of stranded assets, the idea that if you look at the valuations on the books for a lot of fossil fuel companies, for example, coal companies, um, you can make the case, I'm not an economist, but some have made the case that those valuations reflect an assumption um, that all the sort of proven reserves will be burned. Um, so this has big implications potentially um, as we think, you know, and some fossil fuel companies are on record as basically saying climate change is a real problem, but we don't think that the world is going to get its act together um, and, put a, and put a cap. Um, if it happens, um, you know, if, if the world ever does sort of organize around two degrees Celsius or if the private sector or the public starts to demand it, or if investors start to integrate some of these assumptions about stranded assets, um, uh, you know, we could see big shifts in, uh, big shifts in some of the assets of these, of these companies. But um, did I get at all the aspects of the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Dana, I want to ask you a question, thoughts on your, your sort of comment about flood insurance. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that, that people have an affordable home, um, but a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about the Federal flood insurance program is sort of a um, artificially um, saying, re uh, re removing risk from living so close to the coastal edge. And so in some ways putting people in danger of a flood or of harm. Um, and after saying there was a brief commentary about retreat from the coastal edge as a way to protect people um, from future impacts. I'm just curious of your perspective and maybe the current administration's perspective on, you know, how do we manage that complexity? Because we want to protect people even when they don't understand the risk because it's being artificially concealed by really low insurance rates. So any thoughts you okay. could share? So the first part is that um, insurance rates are actually, while they are subsidized um, in the federal National Flood Insurance Program, they're not actually that that low. Um, sure. We've heard from a lot of homeowners. Sure, it's a lot. It's still a lot of money. It's it's a lot of money, um, and they are due to the recent legislative changes. They are moving toward a full risk rate, 
um, which is coming as a shock to, sure. um, to homeowners. Um, so the city's perspective on um, how to balance retreat and, and what we're and what we're doing is um, when you look, for instance, at a place like the Rockaways, there's over 100,000 people living there, and this is their home, and mm -hmm. this is their community, mm -hmm. dating back generations. Um, and what the city is doing is, with our resiliency program, is trying to build to live with the water. So the idea of elevating homes and lifting people up out of the floodplain while still allowing them to maintain their communities um, is the track that we are moving. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, with adaptive pathways, this isn't, you know, we might have to look at this again over time. Mm -hmm. um, and when we go out, I, I work a lot on flood risk um, and flood insurance issues, and I go out to communities and I talk with communities about it. and. We always talk about sea level rise. We talk about what the city has seen so far with our foot of sea level rise in, since 1900. And then we talk about what's coming and kind of thinking ahead, as Radley mentioned, in a 30-year mortgage lifespan, what are the decisions that are going to have to be made? Um, and especially with the rise in insurance rates, mm -hmm. there are decisions that individual homeowners are also Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Other questions from the audience? Uh, ben. Yeah, just a question about Paris coming up. I mean, question for both. So what do you expect to see in terms of the wall? And uh, two, what role, if any, does New York City have in Paris uh, solving some of these problems? Yeah. Um, so I don't have any particular insights, I would say. But um, you know, just re you know, reading the articles, you know what it seems like to me is that the discussions between China and the U.S. Um, does appear to have um, uh, sort of encouraged more countries to step forward making pledges. Um, these pledges are voluntary, uh, so no matter you know, what they are, they're not enforceable, but it seems to me it's a critical sort of first step. Um, one thing that people are talking about, I mentioned this sort of new um, a sort of agglomeration, so you're sort of getting beyond the nation States only as the sort of delegates and other actors, cities, um, uh, NGOs, private sector, um, getting more involved um, uh, in uh, commitments to renewable energy, just to give one example. So it um, seems to me things are moving in a direction towards, um, uh, you know, for the first time maybe beginning to see a path towards us not being on those worst case emission scenarios that we've basically been on for the last five or 10 years. We've tended to track the power 
at the highest or sort of worst case assumptions of, of how much greenhouse gas concentrations might go up. So maybe we're starting to get off of that um, that trajectory. And then, um, you know, I, you know, it, it also seems to me that this discussion about um, stranded assets on the fossil fuel side, there's parallel discussions about risk, right? Which companies, insurance programs are are are, are vulnerable. I think that um, you know the the bottom line for, for some companies who are really really exposed has some potential to be sort of a tipping point in itself. It's hard to predict exactly when um, investors will sort of acknowledge a risk and jump, um, but um, uh, you know it can happen, and it can happen quickly when it happens. Yes, sir. So this is a hard question to phrase. So Are there scientific studies that agree with your assumptions about climate change, but do not agree that humans cause it? And are there other countries that believe the same thing that uh, the Florida politician might believe? That's a good question. Um, so there are some national, there are some national governments. Oh, yeah, so the question was basically sort of, um, I think sort of taking the perspective of the governor of Florida was specifically mentioned. Um, Maybe you know, hasn't sort of focused discussion on climate change or acknowledged necessarily a you know major human role in, in climate change. I think sort of trying to understand that mentality. Are there other countries? Are there scientific studies that would support that? So um, there are uh, other countries right now with governments right now that um, have a, haven't been very aggressive in terms of their pledges of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in terms of the scientific community, um, over ninety seven percent of scientists have of the papers have been published to say there is warming and that it can be attributed to human activities. Um, so that's really, that's the consensus of science. Natural variability can be part of the story for some of this information. If you're looking at one city's precipitation trends, some of that can be natural variability. But when we start to talk about things like global average temperature, the changes in ice and the ice sheets, the sea level rise, it takes an enormous amount of energy um, to cause those changes some natural variability, but the rate of change that we're seeing argues for a human influence, as does the fact that the basic physics um, have been understood for over 150 years. Put these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they're the right chemical composition to um, reflect back the Earth's long wave. It's a blanket, effectively, that, that causes warming. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's the mainstream science. The last IPCC report said you know, there's greater than a 90, we have greater than 95% confidence that over half the warming that we've observed is due to human activity. And that's, you know, conservative science in the sense that it's, you know, all the countries of the world getting together and agreeing on sort of a minimum statement. So that's a very, call that a low bar or a high bar. It's a, not a controversial statement. Great. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. Landmark's getting better on this issue. Like they used to be a lot more um, resistant, but in recent years, um, like you, if you have a, if you lay those PV panels flat on the roof, you can install those. Like you can paint your roof white because no one can see it, and usually there it's a lot. It's like it's really the street issue. Right, it's the view from the street, and that and that's actually being reviewed as well. There's a lot. There's there's an active conversation, and then kind of because of these issues, because it is a real challenge. Um, one more, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of starting back from the beginning of the Bloomberg administration. The first planning effort was really going to be directed towards a million additional people. 
people and the housing that they would require in the process had to be located by the water, which was the, uh, you know, where people would like to be. Now, uh, obviously that is not a good idea, but uh, what is happening naturally is that kind of development is occurring in West Chelsea or along the High Line, even in Coney Island uh, or, or Long Island City. And so what do you do as a pushback for the natural forces of development where people need housing? Well, so um, I mentioned um, during my talk that um, the building code has been updated and um, the building code has been updated to the preliminary FEMA flood insurance rate maps. Um, so plus, so it's not just building above what is considered the flood zone um, and where the flood waters should reach, but it is building an additional, it's called a design flood elevation, it's an additional two feet of what's called freeboard. So, um, so any new development that's going up um, is going to be built to more resilient standards from this point. Um, one last quick question. So I was wondering about pushback to climate change. So if we have some technological initiatives, we have uh, solar panels, we have passive panels, we have wind turbines, we have improved batteries, all kinds of, we have the building trees, we have all of these actions like white roofs. What kind of effects do they have? And if we accelerate those, what kind of effects do they have on climate change? So if we actually went on a war footing and, and, and built massive battery factories and massive solar panel factories and actually had people cave in on even off the coast of Massachusetts and, and put as many uh, wind turbines as they have in Sweden, for example. If we did all that here, then what effect does that have? It's a global problem, uh, clearly. These are well-mixed greenhouse gases, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the role that a city like New York can have in, in sort of being a, a key leverage point um, in economies of scale, um, getting smaller cities to decide whether, they, whether or not this is a track they want to get on. Um, at the US scale, certainly arguments have made too, been made too that you know, we're still per capita one of the absolute leaders in greenhouse leaders most greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Also, if we look at cumulative carbon dioxide, and we're second um, behind China in terms of total emissions. Now, if you invert things, instead of talk about emissions per year, if you talk about carbon dioxide emissions you know, throughout history since the Industrial Revolution, the US is still ahead. So that's where you get some of the arguments people have been made about you know, sort of responsibility. Uh, uh, but I think you know, from purely sort of, uh, you're hearing even more just sort of purely on economic grounds, air quality grounds, arguments that aren't directly linked to climate change, um, that you know, this is looking more and more like a, like a sort of winning proposition. I, I think you know, that's, that, that's an emerging, emerging view. So I think there are a lot of arguments to do it. In addition to the one, um, I mean, basically it's a commons issue, right? If every individual says, oh, it's not my problem, uh, you, never get, you never get anywhere. So that's, that's the argument for why we need policy. Great spot to, to end the conversation today, but Thank you both for Thank you. talking about your work.